My name is Ji Wei Xiao. I'm the chair of the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. Welcome, everyone. I'm very honored to be here to open this DML Alumni Korea panel tonight. It seems that the great British poet is wrong. He said, April is the cruelest month. But it turns out, March is. <laughs> and thank you guys for making the second and successful attempt to come here. Um, I feel very grateful um, to my colleague, the Italian professor, Sarah Diaz, who has spent months trying to put together this wonderful panel. So I want to let us just give her a round of applause. She is the real hostess of tonight's show. I also, I am also supposed to introduce our dean, uh, Richard Greenwald, but he, uh, he couldn't come. He has to go to a wake. Um, he sent his regrets. Uh, I want to let you know that he is a strong advocate for liberal arts education. And you know one of the purpose of this panel is to get you guys to believe to convince you guys of the worth and value of the liberal arts education. So let's do it. Thank you. Thank you, Jiwei. I appreciate that. Um, more importantly, I want to thank everybody here for coming. This is an amazing turnout, perhaps a little bit too amazing. Uh, let's hope no fire inspectors are in the area. Uh, but I'm very glad you could join us here for what promises to be an amazing uh, panel with some really terrific panelists. Uh, my name is Sarah Diaz. I teach all levels of Italian language here, and I coordinate the Italian language program. I'm also the faculty liaison for internships for the department. So if you are looking for an internship, you might come to me, and then I might direct you to your uh, specific faculty member to work with. I've also had the opportunity over the years to work with several uh, student internships, to mentor them in their internships, and I've had I have seen personally firsthand how uh, proficiency in a second language really gives students uh, an edge in the uh, labor market. It really uh, gives you a tool that you could apply in any field. And I think each one of our panel panelists here is going to speak about how knowledge of a second or of a third language has really helped advance their careers and I also imagine uh, enrich their lives. Uh, before beginning, I just need to give a quick thanks to the Department of Modern Languages for making this event possible, the Humanities Institute, Italian Studies, and the Faculty Committee on Public Lectures and Events for their support. Also, I would like to thank Alumni Relations and Kimberly Nicolenko at Academic and Career Development Center for their assistance. <coughs> The format for today's panel is going to be very straightforward. Panelists will speak for about 10 minutes about how their experiences at Fairfield University and with modern languages in particular have prepared them for their professions. Presentations will be followed by a Q&A, and I do hope you'll stay a little longer, grab a bite, a cookie, and chat one-on-one -on -one with our speakers. Um, they're all very nice, none of them bite. Um, I'll now briefly introduce each panelist, and after that, I'll just turn it over to them. So it is, uh, I'll begin with someone who is my extreme pleasure to introduce because she's a former student, and that is Ali Famiglietti. Um, Ali graduated from Fairfield University in 2014 with a double major in Italian and English education. After graduating, Ali moved to Italy to work as the program assistant for Fairfield's program in Florence, and later completed her master's in Italian at Middlebury's Italian campus, and her Italian is excellent. She is now a reservations executive at Perfetto Traveler. Next up is Sean Hassett. Sean graduated from Fairfield in 2010 with a double major in French and German and a minor in women's studies, which is very impressive. Uh, he studied both in Paris and in Heidelberg, Germany while at Fairfield, so keep this in mind. You don't have to study in just one country. Since graduating, Sean has served as the Senior International Sales Specialist at Ulbrich Steel for seven years, where he uses both his French and German language skills to support clients in the special metals industry. Welcome, Sean. Mm -hmm. Our next up is Clevisa Kovacci. She uh, graduated from Fairfield in 2014, majoring in International Studies, Politics, and French. 
She currently works at the oper as the operations coordinator of the Youth Assembly at the United Nations Friendship Ambassadors Foundation. I can't hear wait to hear all about that. Uh, she has engaged in, uh, she has worked with international organizations in France, Indonesia, India, and China, and with uh, UN Women in Kosovo and the permanent mission of Albania to the UN. So thanks for joining us. And last but certainly not least is Jennifer Rollinson. Jennifer Rollinson graduated uh, from Fairfield University in 2001 with majors in international studies and Spanish. She went on to earn her master's in social work from Fordham University and earned her BSN in nursing from UConn. She is currently a registered nurse working at St. Vincent's Medical Center and also has been a preschool nurse consultant for six schools in the Fairfield County and currently works as a school nurse in Norwalk and Wilton Public Schools. This is also Jennifer's second visit to our alumni panel and I know there's a lot to look forward to here. Uh, our last panelist on, uh, on our program, Maria Zachary, couldn't make it tonight because of scheduling conflicts. With that, I turn it over to our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Ali. Um, thank you so much for coming. This is amazing to see so many people who are here. It just like adds to everything that we're doing. Um, I just have, so how many people just to, wondering have already studied in the country of their language? Okay. And then how many people want to study in the country that, of their language? Okay, I, all right. Pretty good, but I feel like everybody's hand should have been raised at some point, but that's okay, we'll get there. Um, and then just out of curiosity, I worked for the Fairfield Florence program after I graduated. Is there anybody here who went through the program or? Okay, one, wow, okay, cool, just good to know. Oh, okay, I can't see everyone. And can you hear me all right? Am I talking slow enough? Because I'm, also, I'm from Long Island, so I tend to talk fast, so just let me know. Okay, great. So um, I think that you guys saw the pamphlet, but when I was a student at Fairfield, I think the most important thing was I was extremely involved here. I think that right now um, you need to be laying your foundation for everything that comes after because everything that happened after, I think once you graduate, at least for me, my experience has just been sort of like a tumbling into life <laughs> and lots of unexpected things, but I definitely felt that Fairfield prepared me for everything that I did after college. So. Um, that's really important. And also just wondering how many of you are upperclassmen, junior or seniors? Okay, so is everyone else a sophomore or freshman? Or you just don't want to raise your hands? <laughs> Which, <laughs> sorry, so sophomore and freshman? I'm just curious. Okay, awesome. That's, well, it's great that everybody's here, but it's really nice to see how many of you guys came. First, well, the fact that you came is just amazing, so great. Okay, good. Um, so during my time at Fairfield, I was an English major and I was an Italian major. Um, and then I was involved with <laughs> peer mediation, I was a new student leader, I was an RA, um, and then I also worked in study abroad and I was just, as you can tell, really excited about everything I was doing here because Fairfield was a great place. But all these things that I did later turned into skills that I used in real life. So I think that if um, you haven't already started seeing which clubs are good for you and um, the ways that you want to get involved, start doing that now. Because Fairfield it has so many resources that are available to you and you need to take advantage of those things. I know that people have been saying this to you since you arrived on campus, but it's so real. And if you leave and you didn't take advantage of these resources, that's on you. So get involved now, not to say that in a <laughs> menacing way, but it, I really mean it, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that involvement was really important because, and then on the other hand, you have the academics at Fairfield, which really prepare you for anything that you're going to want to do later. Um, first of all, your language academics are going to prepare you, you're going to be at a higher level than most people graduating <coughs> in a major, so that's awesome. Um, I personally did a master's in Italian after I graduated, and that was, I felt so prepared, I felt so well prepared by Fairfield to take on the academics afterwards, and I could just tell um, my classmates in the masters were also well prepared, but I just had a, a sort of level of comfort that really let me excel later on. And I think something for me that was really important was always taking advantage of my professors. I always was in Dr. Carlin's office when Doc, Professor Diaz is here, I was always there too. So just use your professors, use your resources. Um, are, do most of you do this already or? Yeah, cool, good. Okay, <laughs> Ben. Um, okay. So all of that is really important. Then 
Um, how many of you studied abroad again already? Just wondering. Okay, cool. That's obviously something that I hope is important to many of you if you're doing language. I really think that you should take advantage of Fairfield study abroad programs because they're there. And um, I personally don't think that you can master a language unless you live in the country where that language is spoken. So if you're really serious about this, definitely look more into study abroad. Um, yeah, and then, okay, so after I graduated, I got a job with the Fairfield Florence program. So Fairfield kindly employed me after I graduated. And <laughs> this was just a, such a good experience, but because I got to use my language skills and I also got to use the skills that I was cultivating at Fairfield. Um, so that was just really important for me to take that next step. And then also on the other hand, the reason I was employed at all when I graduated was because I had these language skills because I really wouldn't have gotten this job at all if I didn't have the skills to use them because when I was in Florence I needed to be able to help students with lots of things. Whoever studied in Florence you already know that you kind of need a lot of help from your program assistants, probably Lorenzo. Um, <laughs> so that was really important. And then um, I did Fairfield. I also did Middlebury at the same time that I was the program assistant which was a challenge, but it was something that I could take on because I was already well prepared. Does anybody have any questions at, at this point or I'll just keep going? Okay. Um, yeah? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay, so Middlebury is an excellent program. Just letting everybody know, if, again, if you're serious about your language of study, they have programs in almost every language. Um, so it's a, it's a, either can be a summer, a year, and a summer, or you can do it in a summer and a year. Because Middlebury has you go, you have to do total full immersion. So you have to already be on the level to be able to do full immersion, which, again, Fairfield prepared me to be at that level. So if you're here, you're probably already good for that, for any master's program in a language. And um, then Middlebury has you go to your country of study. So since I was already in Florence, I'm sorry, I can't see you. Um, <laughs> since I was already in Florence, I just had my roots there and continued the program from Florence, Italy, but, d but doing one um, summer semester at Middlebury's campus in the US. OK, <laughs> no problem. And thank you. OK, so then we'll talk uh, kind of a challenge that I had after Middlebury was that I still want to stay in Italy. And I know that my experience is like pretty unique because I went straight abroad and I went into a job market in a different country. So I ended up getting a work visa in Italy and I ended up taking a job that I just never expected to do, which was teaching English for um, preschool and elementary school students. And this is not what I imagined. I, if I taught, I thought I would teach older people, but it ended up being the best thing I ever did because First of all, I went to a town where I was one of two Americans, and this was a town of 80,000 people, which in Italy is considered a city. <laughs> and I also knew that I was studying in Florence, and Florence is great, but there, it's so international, there are so many Americans that you don't really use your Italian there, but I wanted more, which is something that I learned at Fairfield, and sorry if I'm going over. Um, so I went to Busarsizio, I taught Children, the, the three-year-olds taught me Italian, and that's how I mastered it. But <laughs> a lot of the time that I was there, it wasn't without challenge. A lot, I spent probably the first four months convinced that I was going home every day because it was very lonely. I was now in this environment where I was totally by myself. I didn't have my American comforts that I had in Florence. I didn't have the same access to making friends as I did, but at the same time, something just told me to stay. And if I didn't stay, I wouldn't be where I am now. So those types of full immersion experiences are something that's just a little out of the box. I really encourage you to take. For you, that might just mean studying abroad, but you just have to kind of know that for yourself. Um, and, but when you have the opportunity, do take it. So that was really important to me as well. Then, sorry, just checking my notes. I also don't think that you can be truly fluent in a language unless you fully immerse yourself in it. So I would just keep that in mind. And then, since I was in Bustarsizio, I was applying for jobs. I knew I wanted to come back to America, but I also knew that I wanted to use my Italian. I wasn't willing to accept working in an office and doing a job that had nothing to do with what I had studied and what I had worked so hard to achieve. 
So I ended up finding just on the internet this position that let me move to Rome um, for the summer, this past summer, and then had me transfer back to New York in the fall. So I actually just moved back to New York in November. And what got me that job, which is a reservations executive, which is a really nice title at um, a travel company. So I do high-end tr tourism for people who want to go to Italy, which kind of, after you heard everything that I studied, sounds kind of perfect, I think. Um, but it's because I had uh, my language skills, and that's really everything. I mean, a lot of my experience prepared me for this, but when I interviewed with them, the things that they found most impressive were my education and the fact that I was an American who could speak a foreign language, because just to let you know, like, we don't really, not many of us exist. I know there are a lot of people in this room, but like, you are one of few people and you really need to be aware of that and take advantage of it while you can. So I think that's um, it. If Hello, uh, my name is Sean. Um, I graduated from Fairfield in 2010 uh, with French and German, as Professor Diaz said. And um, most of that was not planned, which is kind of a theme that continues throughout most of the rest of my life so far. <laughs> but it's, it's working out OK. So um, when I started at Fairfield, I thought what I wanted to do was foreign language teacher education. So I just, you know, was going to do French, and that was going to be fantastic. So that didn't work out, which in retrospect, I'm very happy about, because I don't think that that would be a great environment for me at all, um, limited patience and things. But anyway, um, so, you know, I was taking French, then all of a sudden I was like, you know, I, I should add another language too. I should take German also. So I started taking German as well, um, and then sort of made the decision to study abroad in both Paris and in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, which for me, when I went to Paris, that was sort of like an, I don't want to say like easy, but it was a lot easier because I already spoke French very well. So it was pretty easy to acclimate and, you know, do whatever I had to do kind of thing. Um, in Germany, it was definitely a little more trials and tribulation full, I guess you could say. Uh, by the time I'd gotten there, I think I had forgotten almost every single word of German that I learned in basic German. Um, <laughs> which led to a lot of fun experiences, like, you know, talking to somebody at the dryer in the laundry room in the dorm that I was living in, and she's asking me, you know, this has been going on for a long time, like, is there something wrong with it? And I wanted to agree with her, but what I ended up saying was something like, yes, it is allowed to already be done yet. And she sort of looked at me and was like, yeah, okay. So, you know, so many things like that. But I, I think that those are good things to happen because, um, you know, you kind of learn that, whatever, you're going to make a mistake, it's going to be fine, and you're going to just move on with it, and who cares if, you know, some random girl thinks that you don't know how to speak German, because you don't, because it's true, so it's fine. Um, so after that, thankfully, through the time in Germany and the kind of immersion experience that you were talking about as well, um, I picked up a little bit more and was actually able to tell her the next time that it was working fine. Um, so... Following those experiences abroad and, you know, I didn't have any specific plan at all when I was looking, you know, starting to look out into the workforce for a job um, until, you know, randomly, like, just looking at things. There are a few language kind of options that were appealing to me. Uh, where I work now, it's a steel company, essentially, based here in Connecticut. And how does language and steel go together? Well, that's something I had no clue about either. Um, what it is basically is that, you know, I work in the international sales department of that company, which it's pretty small, it's only a few of us, um, but, you know, they were looking for somebody that speaks French and who had had experience abroad and, you know, who also had a second language, which for me was German, which was, is another large sort of area that we do business in. So really the only reason that I had this job is because of the language skills that I had um, and the international traveling experience through the studying abroad and all of that. So, I mean, I guess that's, yeah, it was, it's kind of funny even now because, you know, people always expect me to have some sort of like science-esque background. Like, oh, okay, yeah, do you know about material science? I'm like, no, not really, I know how to speak French. <laughs> but, you know, it turns out that's all you kind of need to start and then everything else, it's, you know, you learn as you go, just like you do when you're acquiring language skills. So, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, study abroad, I think was, a really impactful piece of my growth as a person. Um, 
you know, it just sort of teaches you regardless of how like miserable it may feel that you can't talk to anybody and you're saying everything wrong and everybody's laughing at you and all those <laughs> things. But, you know, you make it through and then you're at the other side and you're like, good, I'm glad I did that. Like I can manage a lot now, like more than you thought anyway. So yeah, I mean, and I can't really speak enough to about the language um, programs and department here at Fairfield. I mean, the support of all the teachers and the programs, both while here and while studying abroad as well, it, um, yeah, you really couldn't ask for anything more. So definitely all the resources that you would ever need are available, which is great. Uh, there's so many fascinating experiences that you can open yourself up to through doing this. Um, and in my job now, I still am able to go back to Europe. I think I'll usually go like three-ish times a year, um, back and forth, and it's kind of funny now too because you know, you're, uh, for me, what I'm doing is I'm basically traveling around to like tiny little places that I would have had no idea existed. Um, you know, just visiting customers and talking to people and sort of really connecting with people on that level of, oh, we speak the same language. And then, you know, there's always that, wow, you're American and you speak French. How do you do that? That's great. And it's, you know, it's like a little icebreaker kind of thing, I guess. And then things go pretty well. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's great. So. That's all I really have to say. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, I'm Clavisa. Thank you so much to the department and to Fairfield University for organizing this and inviting us. It's always such, it's so so exciting to be back. And of course, shout out to my French professors in the room. And of course, thank you you guys for being here. This is such an amazing crowd. So um, while I was at Fairfield University, I majored in French, and in those courses with wonderful um, Dr. Goldfield and Dr. Atopoulos is where I really learned the, um, the mechanics and the theory of foreign language. Then when I studied abroad in Aix-en-Provence, France, that's where I got to put everything that I learned into practice. And studying abroad really gave me the confidence to know that I could like be out there, travel alone by myself, and make it. And that's something that would become very um, important for me later on. I was also president of French club at some point, and being involved with the clubs at Fairfield University really helped me to develop organizational skills and more cultural awareness. So that's why, um, that's my little advertisement for a French club, and of course the other language clubs here. So after Fairfield University, I did graduate school at Sciences Po in Paris and Columbia University, getting a dual master's in international affairs and development. Now what was required for my diplomas was that I had to prove proficiency in a foreign language. So be aware that if you do apply to graduate school afterwards, it could be international business or international um, law, you may be required to prove, again, your proficiency in language. So it is important to keep it up. Um, afterwards, I was an assistant teacher for French in France for a study abroad group of Americans, and then a master teacher for Dartmouth College in China teaching English. Um, and of course, these positions obviously required you know, speaking French in France. Um, and even in China, although I was um, teaching English, what really helped is the fact that I had a background in foreign languages because the people hiring for this position were looking for people who had an understanding of language, grammar, mechanics, um, and some sort of pedagogy that went with that. Um, at some point, I ended up doing an internship with UN Women uh, in Kosovo. And I am pretty sure part of the reason why I got that uh, position and the position with the permanent mission of Albania to the UN is because of my Albanian skills. Literally, it said in the job posting that they preferred people who spoke local languages. And for Kosovo, that was Serbian or Albanian, and I had Albanian. Um, and it's extremely important that you're able to speak the language because it'll, in addition to getting your professional work done, it'll help you connect with the people on a much deeper, much more meaningful level. And you'll really realize that when you're out on the field and you can actually understand what people are saying, but the other UN staff don't. Um, um, at some point, I also um, did a, a consultancy in Indonesia, like a seven month project. Um, and did a very short-term project in India. Now here I was working through interpreters for part of the time. And one thing I have to point out here is that if you don't speak the language on the ground, you're gonna experience exactly what we've all experienced at some point, that you're not quite getting what's going on. And even though we worked through wonderful translators and interpreters, they performed really high quality work for us, it's not the same as being able to connect one-on-one -on -one with the people there. Even if you have just a basic understanding of the language, at least you'll be able to understand where the discussions are going that you're sort of on the right track. Um, so that's what I have to say about working through translators. 
Currently, I'm working as the operations coordinator of the Youth Assembly of the United Nations. If some of you guys have heard about it, it's um, a program that takes place in the UN. It, we bring together about 1,000 uh, young people ages 16 to 28, but we have some older. Um, and they gather in the United Nations headquarters to engage in discussions um, and taking action for the sustainable development goals and um, sustaining peace. So a lot of like international development jargon there, but um, it's quite interesting for me. Um, so in my job, I don't use foreign language uh, a lot. We do have delegations that are coming from um, Haiti or from Francophone Africa, so, so, so sometimes I'll be able to speak with them in French. Um, on my last day of the con conference, I met somebody who was Albanian, and that was really exciting for me. So I got my Albanian on. Um, uh, so um, the last part of my five minutes, or however much I have left, I want to um, give some tips to you guys for how you can engage with foreign language on different levels. So as I see it, there are um, about three levels in how you can engage with foreign language. One is like tier one, top professional level. If you want to work in the World Bank, the United Nations, International Rescue Committee, Save the Children, any of these organizations that do international work and they have field offices all over the world, you absolutely must be able to have a very high level of proficiency of languages. And not just one language, but the, the profile of these sorts of people, like UN staff, they're all fluent, almost always fluent in at least three languages, usually four or five languages. So you do need to be like at the top level of your foreign language because you'll be using your, the foreign language um, in, with clients, with partners, in meetings. It has to be like really top level. Um, and the way that you can achieve that level is obviously by studying abroad and speaking a different language. Please don't study abroad in London or anywhere anglophone. Um, sorry, um, but also do be strategic about where you study abroad. So if you want to work in international development and poverty alleviation, you want to prove that you can work and function in a developing country or in a post-conflict country. That means going to Senegal looks much more impressive than going to Paris. If on the other hand you want to work with international business or um, the luxury goods uh, industry, then going to Milan, Paris or Florence will be really great for you. So the second level on which you can engage with foreign language is a little less intensive, um, is you can do tutoring or translating on your own. And who doesn't need some extra money on the side? So I did that for a bit, um, and it was very helpful. It's a good experience for you. Uh, and it's something that you can do even without having a really, really top level of your language. So I highly recommend that's one way. And it looks really good on your resume as well. It's a good experience. Um, and finally, the third level is um, you have some understanding of a foreign language uh, in which you can engage with people for fun or just kind of on the side. So you can speak with friends in different languages. When you go to different countries, it's always much more fun, much more interesting to connect with people on a personal level, even though you're not conducting business. Um, for me, this, this past few times that I was in New York City, somehow I always ended up with an Uber driver that was from Francophone Africa. So the whole ride we would speak in French and it was really interesting for me to learn about their background and their experience in their country and in New York City. And finally, foreign language is really good for your brain, really wards off Alzheimer's, so it's good to have. Um, <laughs> And uh, I want to finish by saying that uh, this is a very competitive job market that we're living in, probably the most competitive, um, despite getting through the recession uh, with thousands of uh, people graduating with really high qualifications, you need to be able to set yourself apart. And foreign language is one of those things that will open uh, many doors for you. So especially here, I have to say this, especially here where we are in uh, Northeastern United States, the job market, no matter what industry you're in, tends to be very structured, very rigid and saturated. So you definitely want to have like your, your ace cards and foreign language can definitely be one of those. So um, knowing all this and hearing from everybody here, I hope you guys will be able to use language and really leverage them to put yourself, um, to put your best self forward on the job market after. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. Um, <clears throat> so I was just thinking of, you know, when I was here at Fairfield and um, probably sitting in the same seats you all are sitting in. Um, and I heard your thank you for your uh, introduction. Um, and I'm thinking, like, who are you talking about? And then I'm like, oh, she's talking about me. Um, I never would have thought that I would be, um, you know, have a master's in social work, that I'd be a nurse speaking Spanish. I just never thought it would, uh, you know, turn out that way, but I am so happy that it's turned out that way. Um, the reason I mention that is because uh, I think when I was a, a freshman and a sophomore, I did not have a real distinct career path. 
Um, I think a lot of my friends did. I had a lot of uh, friends who are business majors, um, accounting majors, uh, you know, sciences, and you know, they were very clear. They had very clear paths for what they wanted to do. They knew what they wanted to be, and where they wanted to end up. And you know, I didn't really have that. And I knew that, you know, as an underclassman, you know, someone who really needed to develop uh, more of a path, that I wanted to follow and do what I liked, um, and that was foreign language. Um, Dr. Farrell and I have been friends since we were 12, so seventh grade is when we met. Um, and we both sort of pursued um, the same love of, of foreign language and of Spanish, particularly. Um, excuse me. So again, I was just following what I loved, doing what I loved, and I figured, you know, I hope this will work out. Um, I don't really see where I'm going to go with this, but um, I'm just going to continue to do what I'm passionate about, and um, I, I felt pretty secure that it would work out in the end. Um, so when I was at Fairfield, I did study abroad. We've had a, a lot of... Uh, discussion about studying abroad, and yes, it's so invaluable, um, it's so important, it's so helpful, and it's really important to be living outside of your comfort zone. So it really does push you to learn and do things that you wouldn't typically do, um, and only you are going to benefit from that. Um, I also did a mission trip through the chapel to Mexico, um, which again, uh, you know, helped me learn about different cultures, really got me involved with the community, and also gave me an opportunity to practice language again. Um, I think what really, um, you know, kind of looking back on it, what really impacted me the most was um, my uh, working with Head Start. I don't know if they are still active in the community. They are. Um, you know, it was my, you know, the, my job on campus, well, on campus, but not on campus, um, you know, where I was going over to Bridgeport and I was working in some of the schools there. And I just was so impacted by the inequality um, and, you know, they were so close to Fairfield, yet they felt like, I felt like I was, um, you know, in another world. And so it was so important to me to learn more about that and become more impactful um, in their community and their culture, um, which, of course, in other language is in incredibly useful in doing that. So when I graduated from Fairfield <coughs> and I was looking for jobs, you know, again, I was kind of looking for jobs online. I knew I wanted to be in New York. And, um, you know, I saw a job for uh, work in a foster care agency. And I thought, well, you know, I worked with kids, you know, let's try it. So I had interviewed with them and they said, oh, I see you speak Spanish. And I said, well, yes. And they said, great, you're going to be our bilingual caseworker. And I thought, okay, great, let's, let's try this out. And again, it's, it was beyond my comfort zone. I was really thrust into a lot of work that I was Im not familiar with. But it, again, it forced me to kind of step up and, and to push myself to learn and to do more. So with that being said, I did go to grad school and I did get my master's in social work because I did enjoy the work so much um, and I did feel that I wanted to do more. Um, so I pursued that and ended up working for many years at a children's law firm um, in New York City, which was incredible, uh, doing custody, visitation cases, foster care cases in all the, the borough, all the courts and all the boroughs. Um, and being able to speak another language in that sort of setting is, is really incredible. I mean, speaking with foster youth, um, foster parents, uh, you know, all sorts of families and all sorts of different uh, situations, um, many of which were speaking a foreign language. So being able to speak Spanish and really being able to um, impact their lives and improve their lives and really, um, you know, especially on behalf of children, was like so incredibly rewarding and, and it was something I loved doing. Um, and then I went on, then I went on to nursing school uh, and a lot of people would say like, why did you leave social work and you know, what, you didn't like it and it, what, what was wrong with it? And um, you know, absolutely nothing was wrong with it. I just felt like I wanted to do more and I wanted to give more, um, you know, specifically to vulnerable populations. Uh, so that's what I did, um, and I became a nurse, and I started working in lots of different areas, um, and I ended up, I've been working in the hospital for many years at this point, um, and being able to work, again, as a frontline worker, as a nurse, um, with vulnerable populations, being patients, of course, uh, and having another language uh, just adds more to what I can offer my patients. Um, you know, we've got, and I work in Bridgeport, um, which, of course, is an urban setting. A lot of uh, Spanish-speaking patients and families. Um, I worked in I work in family birthing, uh, which is very emotional. It's very intense. 
um, and being able to speak another language with these patients is so incredibly important. Um, one story that I shared last time I was here on the panel was uh, one day I was, I was heading home. I had already changed. I was in my street clothes. And I heard the sounds of um, something that we call a precipitous labor. Um, are there any nurses here? There are. There are a few. OK. Hey, guys. Um, so a precipitous labor is when someone's giving labor and it's, it's imminent. It's going to be really incredibly quick. Um, and uh, all of the emotions and discomforts that go along with that. So you know, I'm kind of getting ready to leave. And I hear this going on. And I, I turn. And I see the, this, there's a, a machine called a Marty machine, which is a, basically it's like a computer, it's kind of um, like FaceTime, um, but you FaceTime with a, a translator, and it, it could be any language. So I see the Marty getting rolled down the hall, and um, someone screams, you know, the Marty's broken, and I, I kind of poke my head and I say, hey, what's going on? And they said, you know, this patient, she's about to deliver, she doesn't speak English, she doesn't have anyone with her, um, our, the Marty's broken, and we don't know what to do, we, you know, will you stay here with us? And I was one of two Spanish speakers on the floor I in totality. So, um, so I said, well, you know, sure. And um, to be able to be there with her through that um, and to be able to experience, you know, communicating with this young lady who was scared, nervous, in pain, didn't know what to expect, and alone um, was, was incredible. Um, you know, to be able to guide and coach her through that and uh, you know, see her baby safely delivered, and uh, her happy, and um, you know, and her safe and uh, healthy, of course, um, was was incredible. Um, the doctor, you know, once I kind of said like, okay, I'm kind of done here. He said, well, you know, I could have done that without you. <laughs> and I said, but she couldn't have. She couldn't have. So. <laughs> so no, that's it. So um, not, you know, doctors are, can be wonderful, um, <laughs> but nurses are better. And, um, you know, nurses are really there for the patients, as are the doctors, but really the patients are paramount. And, um, and you know, he had nothing to say to that. And uh, I kind of turned around and I was like, okay, you know, my shift is over and I'm just going to go home now. <laughs> and, um, you know, all was well and good. So, you know... Um, you know, I was asked, of course, and I think we've all touched upon it, you know, do you have more job opportunities speaking in another language? Of course you do. Um, I was in an interview last week or two weeks ago, and, you know, I came in and they said, the first thing they said to me was, well, I see you're a social worker, you're a nurse, and you speak Spanish. And I said, yes. And I interviewed, and I think maybe less than three hours later, they were calling saying, you know, we want you for this job. Um, so, you know, I'm... It's, you know, I can't say for what exactly, which particular part of the background they were most interested in, but it certainly helps complete the package. And I think that it certainly, as you had mentioned, you know, it raises your level of, um, or, or the ability, the abilities that you have to do your job. Um, and it makes you more, um, you know, well-rounded, more desirable, and I think more effective. Um, they did, uh, my, my current supervisor did go to bat for me to um, negotiate salary, uh, given the language skills and other skills as well. So it is going to help you and, and further your career. And in my case, you know, it helps me help my patients. So I think they, at the end of the day, you know, they win. You know, they're the ones that benefit from this. So um, I guess what I'm trying to say is um, I, too, was in your shoes. I, too, was in your seat. Um, if I had ever imagined listening to myself, I wouldn't believe it because I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, but I did believe that if I did what I loved, that everything would work out and I'd be happy. And I am happy to report that that is true. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I'm very pleased. Uh, I love what I do. Um, I, every day is different. Every day is a challenge. Um, I'm always learning. I love my students. I love my patients. Um, I really appreciate the flexibility of what I do and what I have. I never thought that flexibility would be so important, but as I age, um, I realize that it is. So um, follow your heart, do what you love, and I wish you all lots of luck.
Um, and I know I have a million questions, but I would love to hear from you if you have any questions from our panelists. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, how did you manage to fit all the classes for French and German and your core requirements like in here? <laughs> um, I think actually a lot of it I lucked out with uh, through study abroad uh, requirements. I think that a lot of the classes I took in Germany counted towards my German major. I think actually originally I had or had only planned to minor in German, but through whatever miraculous happening, uh, there were enough credits that I could actually make it a major, you know, coming back and taking another class or two classes, whatever it was. So, yeah, so definitely like if you know, you do go like at least at the time that I was there, there was a lot of uh, flexibility and a lot of you know, assistance to try to make sure that if you want to do this, then, you know, more power to you, you can do it. And Fairfield definitely worked with me to make everything work out, you know, smoothly on that end, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> Can I, I'm going to respond. Um, <laughs> I did, I was an English education major. So first I came to Fairfield and I was like, I'm going to teach English at high school after I graduate. And then as I went through, I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to law school. And that is like the last place I see myself ending up now. So it's just really funny mm -hmm. because as I was going through, I, I took the LSAT as a senior. And I remember talking to Dr. Carolyn and, and I just had this horrible feeling while I was taking the LSAT, like, why am I doing this? This is not worth my time. And then at the same time, um, I was working in study abroad just for fun, because you never know what could happen. And they approached me and said, we have an opening at the Fairfield Florence program, which some, what, something, it's something I said I would never do. And I was in Florence, I was like, never, I'll never do this job. Um, and then I was like, yeah, that sounds better than this. So <laughs> I ended up there. So yeah, I think that like anything could really happen. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, I could say something about that too, I guess. Um, I, for a while, like really thought that I was going to go back to school to pursue a doctorate in foreign language, you know, and probably in like French medieval literature or something like that. Um, but, you know, getting into senior year and after studying abroad, I just kind of saw that, you know, okay, that could still be well and great at some point, but now was not the time. I really just wanted to be out there and be doing things and um, not to say that there's anything wrong with going immediately into school. If you have that discipline and you're able to do that, that's fantastic. But um, I think the important takeaway that I had from that is regardless of, you know, whether I decided to continue and try to go back to school and do all of those things or not, there were still opportunities for me based on the language skills that I acquired here. I think what's um, just a tip, what's really helpful, you go into um, Fairfield University having some sort of idea of what you want to do, and sometimes you change, even if you're very irresolute, you know exactly what you want to do, you might find yourself still adding things or changing them, that's what um, happened with me. But what's very helpful, I think a good tip for you guys is to do some real industry research. So whatever it is that you want to work, part of the reason why so many people change their minds is because they don't know enough about their field or their type of work. Um, so if you want to avoid that, or you want to be as direct as possible, do a lot of like deep industry research. What I mean is network with people who you, whose job you like, who you want to have a job like that. Ask them what it took together. Ask them what their daily life looks like. Literally go up on, go go on Google and look up uh, what it takes. Um, I also recommend looking up different job positions that are open uh, that you would want to see yourself in 10 years because it'll give you a really good idea of what qualifications would be needed and then that way you could work teleologically. You have this goal and then you know what steps it would take to get you there. So I'm saying this because a lot of people, they just go into college saying, I don't really know what I want to do. And by the time it's time to apply for jobs, uh, your, your thinking or your might not quite match the reality or you may think you know what practicing law means until you actually try it out. So do a lot of research, talk to people, network to find out more, um, look up different positions and also try them out through internships. I was wondering, Ali, could you talk a little bit more about internships while studying abroad? Did, did the rest of you also do internships studying abroad or was that? Not because you have that experience as a program yeah, director both. as well mm -hmm. as having had an yeah. of studying abroad. Um, so I studied abroad. I, already, I actually studied abroad in Florence when I was a student. And while I was there, 
um, the program offered an internship opportunity, so I think it also, someone asked a question about combining majors and making that all work, so I taught English in an elementary school when I was studying abroad as my internship, which let me get um, credit for my English major, for my Italian major, and then also that was like a capstone of some sort at some point. Um, so that experience was just what set my study abroad apart from basically everyone else that was studying abroad, but also for myself it made me realize that I wanted to be a lot more immersed in Italian culture. And then um, also when you actually go abroad, make sure you ask your professors and the program that you apply to if this is an opportunity because I don't think you should leave the country that you study in without having an internship experience. Um, most of the Fairfield programs do offer this, I'm like 95% sure. And um, is there anything else I should speak to? Okay. <laughs> and this is for everybody. And this is a general question. If, 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 I know it's kind of a hard question, but your study of foreign languages in a larger sense, how do you think that has prepared you? The way you're, the learning process of the foreign language, how is that mm -hmm. informed? That's a tough one. It's a bit philosophical yeah. almost. Um, well, it's the... I did a philosophy minor, so just bear with me. To understand and to grasp reality as it is, uh, we use language as a medium to communicate it. And so therefore, the more languages you know, the better you are able to describe and to communicate with other people and to connect with other people. There are certain things, for example, like certain words, certain concepts that I think of in Albanian. And I'm sitting with somebody and I'm trying to explain, but they're not getting it. And I can only say it in Albanian um, or French or whatever it is. So it helps you express um, a part of yourself that might not otherwise be as easily accessible or as easily possible. Does that make any sense? I also I also think, like I mentioned, um, you know, it also makes you live outside of your comfort zone, and it makes you a little uncomfortable, um, which is important for, for growth, of course. Um, but, you know, I think of, you know, for example, working in the hospital and working with patients, again, that are so incredib incredibly vulnerable um, in a very, you know, open sort of uh, relationship with me as the nurse, and they're uncomfortable, you know. So I, I understand that discomfort, having, you know, learned another language and they may not speak English or maybe they do a little bit but they don't want to because they're nervous and they don't think it's they speak it well so I think like you had mentioned um, it makes you uh, connect and communicate and really understand your in my experience uh, your patients uh, much better than for example using a, a Marty computer system um, to communicate with them and you know I know I can say I understand how it is to feel uncomfortable and uh, you know in a, in, a, in a surrounding that's not comfortable to me, thinking of studying abroad. And now here I have uh, a patient who may not, who may be from South America, for example, they're uncomfortable and they're having the same experience as I did to some extent. So I would say that it also, you know, really can create a relationship uh, with a person you're working with uh, that goes beyond just language. Just to kind of add to that, I think another thing, you know, that discomfort is really a great tool to use, especially to reflect on, you know, what you would perceive perhaps as, you know, normal or like, you know, your idea of the world. And it really kind of helps you see like, okay, like I am so uncomfortable with this or like all of this stuff is happening, but, you know, you can really appreciate it and you can really appreciate, you know, sort of what you have and as well as, you know, really opening your mind to new experiences and opportunities and just kind of learn to say, okay, you know what, it's going to be fine. Like things happen and it's okay. One quick thing that I want to add into what you were saying is that it helps you build connections and that is very, very crucial because in other parts of the world, especially in the developing world, there are not a lot of people who speak English um, and, and or Anglophones who speak the local languages. So if you do speak the local languages, you have already taken down one barrier that's a wall between you and the people there. And so the people there will trust you a lot more. It helps to build trust. Even if it's a business meeting, you want to do a negotiation and it's going to be in English. The fact that you can speak the the a language of your partner of your the party that you're negotiating with already puts you at a huge advantage like it I've, I've like I've seen this happen in uh, in practice so it really helps you connect and build a trust that only you would have on the people around you the other Americans around you won't be able to get that yeah I definitely agree and a lot of the meetings that you know we have overseas and things like 
going in speaking French, like definitely you can get a lot further than you can, than you could if you did not have that. And definitely. I'm just going to add one thing, which is um, I think the struggle of learning a language is what makes it worth it to begin with. Um, I wasn't lucky enough to be born bilingual. It's something I'm always very jealous of other people for, but I think that because I had to do this myself, it just, first of all, I got to know a side of myself that I never would have known if I didn't take this on. And then also, just to put it shortly, once you are the only person in an eye hospital in Rome who can translate for somebody whose eye is about to fall out, <laughs> and you're like holding that person's hand and the only person that can tell them what the doctor is saying in Italian, you grow also. I mean, she was fine and she got the care that she needed, but those are the types of moments that change who you are fundamentally. And just the only thing that made the difference in that moment besides that I was physically able to hold her hand was that I could speak for her and speak for the people that she needed to communicate with. So that's my answer. <laughs> I would say it's not an extra difficulty that you face. It's actually easier. Because once you've learned one language, then you basically have the tool and the blueprint to learn other languages. It's like playing a musical instrument. Once you know how to read music or write music, and then you can jump from one instrument to the other, including crossing over instrument families. So you can also cross over language families. So learning a language actually, um, it becomes easier. The more you learn, the easier it becomes. Because there are so many connections with the language families, like the Latin languages, that they'll just help you and build over one another. So it's easier, actually, not more hard. <laughs> Sometimes, too, though, with that, if you are, if, one issue that I have that's not really that big of a thing, but if I'm speaking French sometimes, there's only a German word that I can find for like one word in my sentence, which is so frustrating, because you're like, why do I know this in German, but not in the language that I'm speaking right now? Um, but thankfully, a lot of the people that I speak with also also speak German, so it's fine if you just throw it in. But <laughs> it's it's funny to see like the overlaps with languages, and it definitely does get easier though the more that you know. Definitely. Um, immersion. Immersion is a huge one. Um, you can do that, obviously, through studying abroad and being in another country, but for those of you who don't necessarily have um, the means or the opportunity to study abroad, you can immerse yourself within your own home. So when I studied for um, some French proficiency exam, they're very, very difficult. Um, the way that I would study and practice is I would always have the radio playing in the background French news. And <laughs> when I would be doing chores, I'd have the radio playing in the background. I would read all of my news in French, and I stopped reading to reading English news altogether. And that's pure immersion that you can create with in your own home, within your own setting. I can confirm that. Um, I am here, my family and all speak English. My son speaks English, but my husband speaks Chinese. So what I do is just uh, have the radio on. Mm -hmm. So you can just fully immerse in the language. Mm -hmm. When I came here, um, I understand the grammar structure, but I don't really speak. I did not really speak English. So every time I pick up a phone in the legal office I work at, so it's here. <laughs> <laughs> so you basically really have to be immersed in language. So that's, that's what I always say. I think it's also to be more specific to like it can't it for me it has to be something I really like otherwise I'm just not going to pay attention especially when you're at the stage um, when you're not when it's not easy yet so what I started with when I was in college still is um, over the summer I read all the Harry Potter books in Italian because I had read them 12 times in English so I already knew the story and it actually helped for me like fill in a lot of those gaps so if you, even if you have a favorite movie or um, I don't know, you like to listen to cooking shows or something like that, I would like stick to what you're interested in because it'll create that bond. I think that learning about the culture of the areas that you're learning the language of is also really important mm -hmm. because through cultural understanding and through the learning of the language, I think you can really sort of fundamentally connect the two and realize how they influence each other, which is really interesting just even if you look at you know words or phrases that exist in English compared to French or German or whatever um, it gives you kind of even more insight I think into you know what makes you know Germany Germany or France France or, or wherever wherever 
Well, it's 8 o'clock now, and um, I invite anybody who has any additional questions to stay and speak directly to our panelists. And for the rest of you, thank you for coming, and thank you for that wonderful presentation.